kind of like we talked this morning, I think you'll agree uh, everything is lining up for the return of our Savior uh, to call us home. And tonight's message, I think, is in preparation for that. But there was a college football coach one time, and he, uh, some of you can remember back in a time when the mascot, uh, when you'd have a rivalry game, the other team would try to steal your mascot. Uh, in recent years, we've seen other schools go to the other school and paint on the football field and, and paint stuff on the field that don't come off real easy. But uh, back in the day, they used to try to steal the mascot, and this coach was firing his team up. And his particular team, their mascot was a goat, and he was afraid the other team was going to steal the mascot. So he was, after practice, he was all worried, and the team was like, you know, what's wrong, coach? And he goes, well, I'm afraid they're going to steal our, our mascot. And he said, I can't find any place to put it. And so the football boy said, well, put it in our room. And coach looked at him and said, well, boys, what about the smell? And they looked at him and said, oh, coach, go, go to get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd ask you tonight, those of you that have reared children, I would be willing to bet at one point in your life the words have come out of your mouth clean your room and some of you i would be willing to bet uh maybe it was summertime and the kids were out of school and you had to go to work and you told them by the time you got home their room had better be clean now you know immediately i thought of the stanics and all 72 of their children how that uh you know it'd be hard to make all of them clean their rooms but Folks, I believe Jesus is telling his children, I'm on the way home and your room better be clean. And I believe that with everything in me, that God is telling us it is time now to prepare. Uh, you know, I see his hand moving. I, I, I hear and, you know, I, I like to listen to sermons i like to listen to motivationals and everything it seems like it's coming back these days is the same thing he's on his way back he's on his way to take his church home so if you would i want you to know tonight that you are the house of god you are the temple so if you would turn with me to first corinthians chapter 6 I'm going to read you two verses out of chapter 6. When you stand it, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, when you find those verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to start in verse 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come in this house, Lord, and worship you. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful songs that have been sung. We thank you for the testimonies, Lord. And as always, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness. Lord, now it comes to the preaching of your word, and I just pray, Lord, that you'll empty me out of all my flesh, Lord. And Holy Spirit, I pray, God, you rise up in me and speak through me the words that you'd have spoken tonight. And God, I just pray that you rise up in all of us, Lord, and open our ears and our hearts to receive what you're going to tell us so we can draw closer to you and be what you've called us to be. And in Jesus' precious name, his children all prayed. I want you to know one thing. That day when it comes, when... The Bible tells us every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But you know, the first thing I think we're going to realize when we appear in front of Jesus is we were not our own. He owned us. He paid the price for us. You know, it says, as you know, the Holy, the Holy Spirit was sent, the Comforter, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Have you thought about that lately? You are not your own. You belong to somebody. This temple that you've been given is not yours. This spirit that indwells you 
is not yours. It does not belong to you. Listen to the next one. For ye are bought with a price. What was that price? Jesus Christ's life, his blood. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God, do you think he, do you think he earned it when he hung on the cross and died for us? Amen. Amen. He paid a price that we could not pay. That really should change. We, we could stop right there. And I was going to mention, I kind of noticed that I must have been preaching too long. Because 90% of y'all are parking with your cars backed in facing the road. Uh, I watch for the little things. And I can tell y'all are ready to go. So, But that's a sermon for another day. But think about that. If we really let that sink in, would that change how we react to people? Would that change how we view our problems? Would that change how we view everyday life? We are not our own. Somebody bought us. We are the children of the Most High God. And He didn't pay money for us. He paid His life for us. So do we, you know, and, and we just come out of testimony service. You know, really, we should have testimony service every day of our lives. When we go to work, we ought to be telling everybody how good God has been to us. When we come to church, we ought to be telling everybody how good God's been to us. Even in the bad times, we should be telling people how good. You know, if the doctor gives us a horrible report, we ought to look him square in the eyes and tell him how good God has been to us. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's been good to you. Amen. He's gave you the ticket to eternal life, which you could not purchase on your own. He bought us. He bought our house. I want you to think of it this way. He bought our house and he moved the Holy Spirit in with us. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. We've talked about this several times, but go back and read what Jesus said. Jesus said, to the, it is better for y'all that I leave. Can you imagine that? It's better for y'all that I depart and go back to heaven because God is going to send you the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter. So he's bought us a house, the one you're living in right now, and he's moved the Holy Spirit in with you. That is if you're a child of God. And here's the thing I want you to hear tonight. God will not live in a dirty house. Let me say that again. God will not reside in a dirty house. Now, when I say dirty, obviously I mean sin. Because I know if we just talked about a dirty house, us men automatically get convicted. Because <laughs> we get, you know, we don't always pick our socks up. We don't always hit the laundry hamper with our clothes. As a matter of fact, as this sermon was rolling through my head as I left the house tonight, I had to go over by the chair in the bedroom and pick up my belt. <laughs> how it got, I know how it got over there now. But at first I thought, how did my belt get over there? Well, last night, after the cow kick incident, I had chunked my belt across the floor over there by that chair. So we're not always the best housekeepers. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about sin. Folks, I hate to tell you this, but sin affects every one of us. Period. Every one of us have sinned, and every one of us will sin again. But here's, here's the thing. I, I draw so much encouragement from Paul, because as you read his writings, if you put it in chronological order, toward the end of his life, he goes from calling himself the least among the apostles to the least among the saints. He starts judging himself, not really judging himself, but he, he realizes where he's at. How many of us are worthy of what Jesus done for us? Of course not. It tells us our righteousness is as filthy rags. But God loved us so much. You know, and I tried to think of a good way to put this. And I want you to think of somebody in your life that loved you so much that no matter what you done, you were still just... Matter of fact, they overrated you. Can we just be honest? I thought of my grandma. No matter what i done, she still overrated me. My mom probably still overrated me. I bet y'all were overrated by some folks too. No matter what you done, the neighbor may think, oh gosh, here they come. 
But Mama says, oh, that's my angel. Huh. Well, same kid, two different stories. But that's, God loves us no matter what we do. Now, does he get discouraged? And do, do we break his heart? Amen. And the biggest heartbreak that he has, you hear a lot of people talk about the unforgivable sin. Let me tell you what the unforgivable sin is. To live your life and never give your heart to Jesus Christ. And to die and to go to hell after what he done for you. Because it just told us, we just read in scriptures, he bought us with a price and we reject that. And then go to Satan. I say this all the time, but I believe with everything in me it's true. That path to hell will be covered in the blood of Jesus as people walk through his blood. His footprints of going to hell will be, have Jesus' blood on their feet. But God will not live in a dirty house. And you say, how do you know that? Well, let me read it to you. Matthew 21, 12 and 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Let me tell you what they were doing, folks. They were, they were changing money. Most people in that area at that time spent Roman currency. So as they would come into the temple to pay their tithes or to, to purchase a dove for sacrifice, they would give the money exchangers Roman currency in, cha in exchange for temple coins. Well, what the exchangers were doing, if you gave them a dollar's worth of Roman coins, they'd give you back 50 cents worth of temple coins, and they were pocketing 50 cents out of every dollar. And not only that, after, that, after all the money was cast into the, into the treasury, they'd go and remove that money and bring it back to themselves. Folks, they were just flat out stealing. They were thieves. And where were they? They were in the temple of God. They were in the house of God. Well, let me ask you something. We look at that and we go, oh, that's horrible. How could that ever be? Have you saw what we've turned religion into today? Folks, religion is a big business. And I just wonder if Jesus wouldn't walk in and overturn our tables today. Not, I'm not talking about Kegelsville Church today, folks. I'm talking about the church world as a whole. There's a lot of CDs being sold, a lot of books being sold. If you give this much money, we'll send you this free gift. I've not yet figured that one out. If you're sending in money, how's the gift free? I'm pretty sure you just paid for it. But how would you feel if God moved you to write a book to help other people and then you sold that book. I'm not real sure that adds up with the God I know. I believe, because either way you look at that, money becomes an issue. Folks, money was the main issue in the temple this day when Jesus walked in. You see, they had, the, they had turned the temple of God into a business. I'm telling you today, our, our nation has turned worshiping God into a business. They've got smoke machines. They've got lights. They've got all these special things that require this. They've got preachers who will only preach certain things because, Lord help, they don't want to offend you because they, when they pass that plate around, they want you to put extra money in so they can make more money. We'll talk about that another day. But, they were stealing, we're stealing today. Money was an idol then, money is an idol now. I'll tell you this many, many times, but I want you to think about it. If you just went out into an average city in our country today and you pulled in 100 people off the street and you said you can have $2 million cash or you can have the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your sins and you can go to heaven when you die. What do you think the majority of them is going to pick? Because why? Because they trust in the dollar more than they trust in Jesus. You see, Jesus is somebody they've heard of. My neighbor goes to church and I've heard him talk about Jesus. They can't lay their hands on Jesus. They can't see Jesus 
but they can lay their hand on a dollar and they can see what a dollar does. Folks, that is the enemy. Who did, who did God tell would be blessed in the Bible? He said, he told the apostles, you are blessed because you have seen and believed. But oh, how blessed those will be who have not seen and believed. And that is you. If I made that offer to you, I certainly hope everybody would pick Jesus Christ. I would not offer that to the crime family. I'm just, I just offer that to these other folks. But seriously, think about this. I'm, I'm trying to get you in a certain mindset tonight. What if God granted me a special power tonight and I could come to each one of you and say, okay, you can start your life over again at 18 years old and I will give you $40 million. Or, and that's, that's the only guarantee you get, or you can start your life over again at 18 years old and you have the most intimate relationship with Jesus Christ starting at 18 that any man has, or woman has ever had on this earth. What would you pick? In your own mind, be honest with yourself. We've got to make sure which God we're serving. Because our Bible tells us we can't serve two of them. you got to pick. And I can assure you, you know, in Colossians 3, it tells us to set your mind on things above. What can you buy that's above? Name me one thing. I know some of you really love the 67 Chevy. Are they up there? Probably not. What about the people who drive the 67 Chevy? Are they up there? They sure can be. Setting your things on things above. What can we take with us? You know, I think I've shared this with you before, but we used to tease my grandpa a lot about being tight. We'd, we'd make fun of him. And we, we took a pic, we got a picture one time of this chimpanzee sitting on a suitcase with money coming out of it. Said you can't take it with you. I can still remember that just like it was yesterday. But seriously, what can you take with you? Somebody else. That's all we can take. So why do we worry and why do we strive to buy things down here? Especially because, well, our neighbors got it, so we need it. <laughs> well, the only thing our neighbor might have that we need would be Jesus Christ. But, oh, how we get wrapped up in that. You see, 2 Corinthians 6.16, it addresses this issue. And it says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let me rephrase that. What business has the child of God got with money or any other idol? One of the biggest eye-openers in mine and my wife's spiritual lives and I think those of you that have been here from the beginning know how we believe on this money is just something you use to bless other people if you focus on money if you try to save all this money folks I worked with a man who, who everything was about saving the last dollar I, I mean, I can still remember him sitting there drinking that coffee and looking and talking about scraping and saving and retirement. And less than a month after he retired, he died. Folks, money, treat it for what it is. It's a tool to bless other people. And I can promise you from personal experience, if you take the worry of mind, uh, money out of your mind, you just concentrate on God. When you need it, it's there. And when you get extra, bless it. Period. Look what it's done in this church. I encourage you. Miss Joyce fills that paper out. Stop back there and look at the balance. Folks, you cannot outgive God. And as long as we continue to help and bless, that will grow. But the day, and folks, I can... 
That is one thing God gave me discernment on more than anything else. When I even feel a sense of people pulling back in that area, I just start tingling. We can never pull back from helping people. The minute we do, you'll see that go down and down and down and down. Because money is supposed to flow through us. We're not a bank. <laughs> and like, I, I love talking to Miss Joyce because she don't text. I don't know if y'all don't know that or not, but Miss Joyce is not on my text list. I may get her a phone for Christmas so I can just text her. But when I call her, she tells me the same thing every time I can lay money on it. And it just blesses my spirit. It's not our money anyway. It's God's money. Amen. Amen. We shouldn't hesitate, folks. Now, I, I do know we have to have discernment and help where we need to. And we don't need to further any problems because, folks, money don't solve money problems. I promise you that. God solves money problems. But if people are in need, folks, and, and I just feel like we're beating a dead horse there because y'all are so giving. Y'all are wonderful in that area. But if you ever want to shut the valve off, start having a bad attitude about it. What kind of, what kind of giver does God love? Cheerful. That's exactly right. Because, folks, look at it this way. Look how blessed we are to be able to help people. And I am by no means criticizing any other church. But folks, you, you, you are the church, okay? It's not me. You, you help more than a lot of great big churches. You help more people. And folks, that just makes my heart swell because I see God's hand moving through you. But you see, I told you God wouldn't live in a dirty house. There's a lot of things God don't want in his house. God don't want music with bad lyrics. And I, I've i looked at what the world has this past week, and it's all dirty. I mean, they're, they're into this nasty lyrics, and they've got all these different kind of games that are inappropriate and words and songs that are inappropriate, television shows that are inappropriate, movies that are inappropriate. All these things are inappropriate. Do those things belong in God's house? Would anybody... I'm trying to, would anybody be comfortable if we wheeled our new TV out here and hooked it up and we had movie night and we come out here and played a raunchy R-rated movie? Would everybody start cringing? Well, guess what? If you watch one in your house, you just did it in the house of God as well. This is not the house of God, folks. You are the house of God. Now, is this a special place? Amen. Because where we come together and we owe it reverence. But, folks, you are the temple. This is not the temple. You are the temple. So what does God want in our house? So simple. And we spend so much time trying to figure it out. But at the end, folks, I believe this with everything in me. When we meet Jesus and he gives us the secret of life, <laughs> it's no secret at all. What does he want in our house? Love. He wants, he wants Carolyn to love Scotty, Scotty to love Gwen, Gwen to love Jeff, Jeff to love Sharon, uh, Sharon, Sharon to love Tony, Tony to love Charlie, so forth and so on. And you know what? It's easy because we're all in this room, right? But what about the ones outside the room? What about the ones who don't have our political views? <laughs> it's okay to be mad, folks, but you got to love them at the end of the day. Because they, guess what? They are made in the image of God. Now, have they went left of center somewhere? They may have. They may have drove their car off like Sister Carolyn tried to walk off the sidewalk. They may have drove completely off the road. But does it mean you don't love them? No. We need love, folks. We need more of Jesus. If we remove everything from our house or our life, whichever way you want to put it, that doesn't glorify God, then we will witness his power in our lives. How many of you would like to see God move through you? Amen. How, let me ask you this. How many of you, this is what, September? 
How many of you would like to lead somebody to Christ before this year is over? Amen. Let me tell you how you do it. You remove everything from your life that does not glorify God. And only you can answer that. I encourage you tonight. You, you get some time alone and just va evaluate your life. What do you do that glorifies God? And what do you do that don't glorify God? Remove the things that don't glorify God and watch his hand move in your life. I want to close with a story out of the Old Testament. You want to see the hand of God move. Let me ask you something. Do you remember when God, when they said that if you don't, if you don't praise God, these rocks will cry out? Do you think our God is powerful? Do you think he can have anything he wants on this earth? The only thing that he might want that he can't have is the heart and soul of all his children. Because Why? Because he gave us the freedom to choose. And folks, that, that takes love right there. God could, have, God could have made us robots and made us love him. But instead, he knew that really wouldn't be love and it really wouldn't take faith. But this story in 1 Samuel chapter 5 Folks, this is how powerful. Nobody else has to be there but God. I want you to understand that. But listen to this story. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Mm. Folks, no one or no thing can stand up to our God. And no one or no thing can stand up to his children when they allow him to live through them. Folks, that's just, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. If he falls on us, it crushes us. But if we fall on him, we are saved. Folks, no matter what God, in the Old Testament it was Dagon, and today it's money, or there's still some people who worship Buddha, whatever God you want to... Folks, they cannot even be in the same room with our God. That was the Ark of the Covenant. They, it, it, their God couldn't even be in the same room. At first, it fell down. I don't care what they say, it fell down to worship. And they stood it back up. God said, oh no. It fell down and the head was removed and the hands were removed. Nothing can stand up to God and nothing can stand up to you when you allow God in your house. If you would, stand with me all over this building. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is a very special time. And I just simply ask you one question tonight. It's the only question I have for you. If Jesus Christ came back right now, would your house be in order? If it would not, please come to this altar and make things right with God. What condition would the Savior find your life in tonight? Where is your heart tonight? Please be honest with yourself. This has eternity on the line. How would Jesus find you tonight?
because I'm going to tell you folks, it's very possible that Jesus could come back tonight. He could come back in the morning. How are you with him? Is there anything in your life that you need to talk to Jesus about? Maybe you have doubts about something. Maybe you have some fears. Maybe something's just worrying you. I don't care what it is tonight. Just like Dagon, their so-called God, your worries and fears, they cannot stand up to Jesus. They cannot be in the same room. When Jesus enters, fear leaves. Doubt leaves. All you can feel is love. The warmth, the caring. That's where we ought to want to stay, church. That's where we ought to want to live. Is right next to Jesus with his hands around our back and one hand holding our hand leading us. If you need anything tonight from Jesus, this altar's open and we'll gather and pray with you and we'll seek the face tonight of our Heavenly Father.